<laughs> that lady who follows me everywhere. I know she's she's in my dreams. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I know. If they ever change that voice, it's gonna be really strong. Okay. All right. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to the panel on uh, startup founders, unicorn and rainbows. Uh, first, thanks to Kate Cedar for putting on uh, Tacoma Startup Week this week. He put on a lot of great events during this week. A lot of a lot of stuff. Also, I thanks to Karina, uh, who works in Maritime Incubator. Have Karina come over fast and talk about what she does and what she does in startups at Washington Maritime Incubator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to write my notes here so I don't block any of the panels. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karina Martia Harris. I'm with Washington Maritime Blue. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning to come out and join us. I really appreciate it. So what we do at Washington Maritime Blue is we help entrepreneurs, specifically within the maritime trade, logistics, and sustainability space, find the resources that they need in order to be successful. So our incubator program here is local in Tacoma. It's a one-year program where we offer resources such as free rent, mentorship, and networking events such as this. Um, I'm proud to announce as well that our second cohort recently just graduated the program as of Wednesday. So we will be starting a new cohort in January of 2024. And that will be, those cohort members will be announced here fairly soon. So thank you again for coming and I'll turn it back to you, Jason. Thanks, so my name is Jason Cabinets and the CEO of Founder Cabinets HR. So we do HR companies pointing out a few people automating HR products and services provided by HR business partner. And right now, for everyone in the room or taking part of Startup Week, we'll, we'll do your handbook and HR products for free, plus give HR advice for anyone. Also do a podcast called the Jason Cabinet Experience. Three of the four panelists have been on there, and Ellen is going to be on there in January. So make sure you check that out. So we got started. So first question is, uh, how do you take care? I'll go with Laura first. How do you take care of your mental and physical health? And I can be fully transparent. That's something that I suck at, right? Like I go to the gym four or five days, don't go for two months, and mental health always struggles with self doubt, like mental health stuff. Yeah. Can um can we hear from the panelists like who everyone is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> All right, <laughs> James, keep over. Sure. Uh, my name is James Marzalek. I own Operation Red Dot. It is a full-service real estate brokerage focused uh, pretty exclusively on the military populations across the U.S. Uh, we started here at Joint Base Lewis McCord back in 2016. We're in six locations here in Washington and due to be in 75 by the end of 2025. And Dave, can you tell us what problem you're solving? Yeah, ultimately, uh, the military does a poor job of moving military service members around. Uh, they move 400,000 families a year and ultimately don't provide the resources and the time and just all the things that they need to do it effectively. And so we are sidelining the Department of Defense in their process of moving those families around uh, to solve a housing crisis, ultimately, for affordable and accessible housing. Thank you, Sarah. Can you go next? Sure. Um, my name is Sarah Bell. I'm a co-founder at Leap Sheep. Um, the problem that we are solving is that if you are a first time founder or um, even if you're a second or third time founder, it's extremely difficult and tricky to build a startup. Um, and there are very high failure rates. And yet it's something that's extremely worthwhile and fabulous to do. Um, currently, there is no startup playbook. Um, and so that is what we're building at Leap Sheep. Um, we've been around for about seven years and we basically work with founders to help them um, basically go from all the way from idea and exit, uh, all the way from idea through to exit um, and basically help them to kind of um, use their resources effectively, waste less money and actually learn kind of how to how to build that startup effectively. And Sarah, what do you reach your job? Startups will look like being the last year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the challenges that we find as soon as we meet founders is typically kind of, um, and the ecosystem also encourages this, it's like you think, well, how am I going to build this business? I'm going to hire a software developer, um, like build a product, kind of get it, launch it in the market as soon as I can, hire a marketing agency in order to sell that product. Um, but actually there's a ton of steps to take first. Um, and so typically founders start with those things because it seems obvious it seems like the right thing to do but actually it can lead to 
massive wastage of billions of dollars of uh, of money that's basically misallocated. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve is helping founders spend their their resources and their time eff- effectively. Um, yes. But we are also a startup ourselves. Oh, Hi, my name is Eleanor McIntosh. I am the co-founder and COO of Twipes. We make wet wipes that break down in water in three hours and break down in landfill in seven days. So the problem we're solving is obviously wet wipes, they claim to be flushable, but they don't break down at all. So I'm the lead scientist on this. This is my invention. So our product actually does what it says on the tin. We moved from the UK to America. So we are in the East Coast in Buffalo. And since then, it's been like a massive journey for us, learning all of the American traits, all of the habits, and just coming from somewhere in the UK where people kind of get the idea to somewhere where there's a ton of wet wipes being used in the States. Thanks, Laura. Laura, you go next. Hi, my name is Laura Malcolm. I am the founder and president of Given Kind. We're a platform for organizing support through challenging life moments, new babies, illness, loss. Um, the problem we're solving, I have a slide, I say we're solving the flowers problem. So when my husband and I went through a big loss, we had 75 beautiful bouquets sitting on our shelves and um, we're hungry. Mm-hmm. So we were uh, trying to make it easier for people to support anyone from anywhere. Um, We've been around for seven years, spent three of them venture backed and were acquired uh, in December of last year. So I now get to call myself a recovering CEO as I lead the business, lead the business in a different role. Love it. Thanks, Laura. All right. So back to the original question. And thanks, Ali, for doing that. Um, So how do you take care of your mental health and physical health? Like me, like I said, I I, I suck at it, right? I'll go to the gym three or four days, won't go for two months. Mental health is always a struggle, right? South Delta kind of stuff. So I'll go with Laura first. How do you take care of yourself? Well, I think it's, for, for me, it's making time for whatever that little thing is that checks multiple boxes. Um, for me, I have uh, two little kids at home. They keep me busy. There's not a ton of me time. Um, I'm a hobby gardener, so I um, spend time uh, outside doing manual labor that checks sort of the physical and mental and financial box for me because then I'm not paying for whatever I grow. So that's uh, one way that I uh, take care of my mental health. Um, I think in general, it's about routine. So making sure that you, echoing what you said, making time for yourself, but it really is a routine. So when it comes to business, you've got to make sure that you, you know, you wake up early in the morning, you start your day at work. Mental health is really about that too, waking up and choosing yourself every single day to making sure that you're, you're okay. Because if you're not, you can't do anything. You can't do your business. You can't, you can't meet your friends. You can't do any of it. Thanks, sir. Um, I might tackle it from the actual work side if that's all right um so one of the things that I think um as a co-founder that there's always so many things you could be doing in your business like you could be doing marketing you could be trying to meet people form connections um but a lot of the time it's easy to be really really busy without a really clear idea of actually what you're aiming for um and so one of the ways to stop that is to basically think right of all of the things that I'm doing what can I stop doing um, and the best way to work that out is to have really clear goals and then look at your what you're actually working on and think, right, is any of any of these not helping me achieve my goals um, in order to then help you to achieve your ultimate vision? And if anything isn't, then stop doing it. Because, like, yes, you know, the mental health and everything outside of work is really important. But if you work yourself into the ground doing like 18, 20 hours a day, like there's no way that any sort of mental health outside of the business is going to kind of make the the inroads that you need it to. Thanks, sir. Jane? I really think this all comes down to the research in uh, research in neurobiology of flow states. It was a really interesting conversation, but I think uh, there's a, a four-stage cycle in flow states where one of those sections is called active recovery. And I think a lot of people oftentimes are just, like you said, busy, and they feel like they're getting a lot of work done, but they they're they're negating and neglecting the recovery time. And when people think about recovery, it can oftentimes be, well, I'm going to go watch a TV show or I'm going to listen to this audio book. Um, but active recovery from a neurobiological sense is actually what I call non-time. It's It cannot be cognitively engaged stuff. And so this might sound ironic, but wall staring is something that they talk a lot about from a neurological uh, perspective, but also things that take you out of hyper-focus and more into a scatter focus. And so it's, it's ultimately for me, it's about time blocking non-time and actually taking time to let my brain recover um, from a, a real neurobiological sense. There's so much going on in the brain that people ne- 
really neglect. And I think it comes down to having that process of actually forcing yourself to recover and having that time for you. James, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Would you say meditation would be something that you would be calling this sort of recovery? Meditation time? is definitely involved. Yeah. Uh, Yoga Nidra also fits the bill for that, but there's a lot of different meditations are definitely non-cognitive kind of letting that flow. Yeah, that's a good question. I had an investor once say that she would rather that we take a nap than work on something that doesn't move our business forward. Yeah, and sure. I think when you get into that busy state, right, yeah. and that that um, that neurological overwhelm, sometimes we can just sit there and be like, there's so much to do. I don't even know what to do at this moment. And if you try and push through that, you're not going to make progress. Yeah. And so I would find myself, particularly in the midst of like a fundraise, for example, taking a break in the middle of the day, going on the couch, weighted blanket, and like just letting my nerves reset because yeah. you can come back so much more productive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, before we do any more questions, could I just, I'd love to have a bit more of an idea of who's in the audience. So perhaps like kind of if, maybe put your hand up if you're uh, like a startup founder and then the other one will be, are you perhaps thinking about making the leap to be a founder? Um, so perhaps hands up if you're a founder at the moment. Oh, oh okay. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm intrigued as to the, uh, what the what's the right question? Oh, uh, have you been a founder? Oh, okay. You've been a founder previously. Yeah. Okay. Any other founders? Yeah. And hands up if you're thinking about becoming a startup founder. And hands up if you perhaps put yourself in the entrepreneur category. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. And then. If I haven't asked the right question, maybe put your hand up so like um <laughs> okay, all right, that's covers everyone. All right, great. Okay. So the purpose of the panel isn't that the surgeon will be an entrepreneur, we need more entrepreneurs. But from my point of view, too many people they get an idea, they run with it, but they have no passion for it. And three or four months later they run out of money and they have a horror experience, right? So the next question is, how has your passion for what you're doing enabled you to accomplish what you've accomplished so far? I'll go with Laura first. Um, I mean, I think I've, I'm very fortunate to have uh, spent my time doing something I care deeply about. I, I think that most founders, right, probably the vast majority of founders, I hope are there because they care deeply about solving the problem they're solving. That mm -hmm. is what, for me, carried me through the toughest times, the days where you're just like, I don't want, I would walk away. If this were a job, I would walk away. Um, it's a privilege, I think, to get to um, solve what it is that you uh, care deeply about. And I lost the question. <laughs> is that, is that it? How do you, you keep on going? Yeah, I mean, I think that that it, it's you have to lean on that in those moments where you feel like you can't uh, go any further. Yeah, um, I think it's about solving challenges. So, as founders, we all want to solve a problem, much like what you were saying. But it is that drive to wanting to solve it. And if the problem is big enough and the problem is important to, to you, you will continue and continue and continue to do it. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of days where I sit there and go, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, want to, I don't want to get up again. I don't want to do this. I just want to be in the lab where I'm safe, away from people and not having to be on stage and pitching or any of that stuff. But you think about what it means to do that. If you can inspire one person to make a change, if you can inspire people to actually start their own businesses and work on those problems, then you've done your job as a founder. Yeah, fair. Um, it's a really good question. I mean, I I think if you're, I, I very much agree with what you've said about finding a really big problem. I always like to call it a pants on fire problem. Like mm -hmm. if, you're, if your customers have a problem that is so significant, it's like their pants are on fire, then talking to customers about that problem and really deeply understanding it and really understanding kind of what's causing it how does it fit within the context of their other problems having those kind of conversations makes uh, it a lot easier when you're having challenges because like building a startup is hard we've been building ours for seven nearly eight years and that you know there's there's kind of steps along the road you know like do you try and raise do you bootstrap like, you know, who are the right people to bring onto the team? Like, how do you make all of these decisions? And so the only thing I would bring it back to is, like, it is a hard journey to build a startup or even, you know, as an entrepreneur. But if you can find that pants on fire problem and you've got kind of validation from your customers that you're actually able to help them solve it, that's really what keeps you going, even through late nights 
like things that go wrong that that's it for me thanks sir I think for me, I, I think I'm going to say a lot of the same things that have already been said, but in a slightly different way. I think about it in a two-phase process where first I'm going to start with a what I call a massively transformative purpose, something that's going to move the needle for the community that I'm uh, trying to serve. But then it's, so that's the macro version, right? Where we're starting at the, what am I doing for the world around me? But then personally for me, when it comes to how is my passion driving me forward, it really starts with that massive transformative purpose needs to be driven by intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic motivation. So I'm, I'm not doing this for money. I'm not doing it for fame. I'm not doing it for external things. I'm doing it because I'm passionate about whatever it is that I'm trying to solve. And I, I think that's really what it is. So when I wake up every day and look at myself in the mirror, it isn't, let's go get that dollar, right? It's not the hustle porn as it's called. It's uh, it, it's really about the work that I'm putting in every hour, every dollar, every piece of effort is going towards moving that mission forward. I'd like to double click on this a little bit in, in talking and thinking about customers and the customers that we're serving, right? Yeah. That we know that there's a, um, a challenge, I think, early on in startups where you've had this problem and it, it can be terrifying depending on your, you know, your personality um, to go out and talk to customers, right? We know that's like a fundamental failing on so many startups is you didn't actually go out and find out if they have a pants on fire problem. Yeah. I think that's also the painkiller vitamin yeah. analogy, yeah. right? Um, I think one of the most beautiful things happened for me when I started out uh, and we were launching Given Kind, it was centered around my own loss. And over the years, we dropped all of that from the pitch because people would say, well, you're now the story of your customers. Your story is the people that you are helping, yeah. right, James? This wasn't just a problem you were solving for you, yeah. but you get that validation of the problem that you're solving by seeing the customers that you're helping, the startups that you're helping, the scientific problems you're solving. If you're doing that in a vacuum, then when you feel tired, you can say, well, I don't want to solve this problem that I had for myself anymore. But now as you start expanding and getting customers and talking to people, you want to solve it for all of them. And so I think that just reiterates the, you know, understanding that deep need that your customers have. 100%. Good question. We're going to take questions. Oh, okay. So Laura, we'll follow up on that. Talk about your, your process with that, what you think you did right, what you did wrong in that process. Ooh, I didn't talk to enough customers. There's never enough customers, right? I will say day in and day out, we've never, I've never, I hear it, I see it, and I use the feedback that comes in as um, having been feedback on the product, but we know that like for every one issue a customer is experiencing, 99 of them have experienced that issue and not reported it, right? For every positive feedback you get, you probably could get more of it from your users. So um, I think there is, if uh, you think you're talking to your customers enough, you're probably not. You probably see this in startups too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that, that that to me is one of the, the things that we have not done enough. We don't do it enough now that we're expanding from being a consumer platform into an enterprise platform. Um, I think talking to customers is um, one of the things that founders have to stretch a muscle and get used to doing, make it a part of your routine every single day. Otherwise, you're going to build in the wrong direction. I mean, I think about that customer feedback as being, you know, barriers on the construction road, keeping you in the lane. As soon as one barrier is missing, you're going to veer off, veer off course. Now, on the same question for you, what did you do right? What did you do wrong in your customer research process? So we spoke to our customers very early on. So we, when we first started, we did surveys, we honed in on our customer profiles and we spent a long time speaking to them. I think the problem we had is that we didn't keep speaking to them. So we spoke to them in one year and we got all of this data and it was amazing. And we went the next year, we got all this data and it was amazing. And then we moved. And when we moved into the States, especially, our customers changed. Our customers, we based a lot of our research on the customers in the UK and it had similar assumptions. And it's only now that we're really like, oh, no, there are differences. There are big differences in culture. There's very differences in use cases. And there's differences in how people use wet wipes in America versus in the UK, how they dispose of them, how they talk to, how they interact with companies as well. So at the moment, we're learning to speak to our customers even more so now, whereas before we collected all this data from the UK, when this is great, we're going to try and apply the same thing in America. And it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. When we did some customer feedback, we realized, OK, we have to change the entire website. We have to change how they get their messaging, what their messaging is, what that meant 
the yeah. differentiation between what types of wipes they're using and what they're using for you know i didn't know there were like 40 different types of wipe that one person uses for all different use cases i didn't know that you could use that the same wipes that i use in the bathroom are not going to be used on their children are not going to be used on this person are not going to be used on that and it's just a case of speaking to your customers and continuing to do that and as your company grows you have to continue to make sure that your customer is being satisfied so with that eleanor how was it like i think the right word is being humble right you were humble enough like pivot make changes a lot of kind of like i don't care what the customer said this is what i want to do but you were humble enough like pivot so this was how oh. you know, that mindset you need as a founder yeah it's a quick way to destroy your business if you're not thinking about how your customer's thinking if you're like i'm so right i'm gonna go for what i want to do and forget my customers you're gonna lose your business so quickly you've got to get rid of that ego like everyone i mean as founders i don't know if I've, i'm just gonna speak for myself when we first started taking criticism was really hard and it's like that's my baby please don't tell me my baby is ugly and it's like now I'm just like yeah okay tell me everything I want your bad feedback I don't want you to blow smoke up my behind I want you to tell me what's wrong tell me how I can fix this because if I can then I know my business is going to grow and you have you have to throw your ego out of the door completely and be open to not just criticism I've had people be like this isn't going to work and I'm like, okay, why do you think? No, it's just not going to work. And I'm like, okay, well, we can we can separate that feedback to constructive criticism. Sarah, so this is something your company actually specializes in, right? So you can go into details on how you help startups do the market research and the importance of it. Yeah, sure. I'm also just going to add one thing to what you said. So um, there's a quote, and I'm not sure if uh, someone else has said it, but I use it a lot, which is, if you fall in love with your customer's problem, like you're on to something, if you're in love with your solution idea, then you know, anytime you meet a customer, they're going to hit you in the face with that feedback if, if the two aren't matched. Mm. Um, I also want to, can I add a bit on <laughs> to what you said as well? The, the conversations with customers is super important, but there's a couple of things that you want to think about, um, which is firstly, how can you find your niche customer segment? Um, it's kind of commonly called a beachhead, but it's typically like, what is the niche kind of easiest route into a big market? Um, typically we find that founders start with an idea of who their customer is and it might be like an example from yesterday is um, like women in Darwin in Australia and I'm like oh, that's quite a broad market if you can really think and go to the real edges of where you think the problem is the biggest and then be as specific as you can about exactly who that customer is what's the context of you know the problem that they might have and then go and have conversations with those customers and be so, so specific about them. Because then, and the other element is, is that um, almost always we find that founders go out and they'll talk to their customers, particularly when they're in the solution concept idea, and they'll say, like, you know, I've developed this solution. Like, what do you think of it? Mm. And it assumes that the people that you're talking with have got that pants on fire problem and that they're willing to pay to solve it and that it's a really important problem in the context of their other problems. Um, and so the concept that we teach um, at LeapSheep and which we have done ourselves is to carry out um, something called user research. And that is when you go, you have a hypothesis of your customer and their problem, and then you have conversations with them in the place that's most convenient and appropriate for those people. You might say that you're doing a research project um, and you know, you're kind of thinking about investing in a solution. And then you ask them about themselves, like how are they spending their, their time? What does success look like for them? What are some of the challenges that they're finding? And you, you don't talk about your solution, even if they ask you about it, until you have got that kind of rich customer information in their own words. Mm. Because then when you find what those big challenges are, and when you speak to multiple customers, you can start to find patterns of problems that you can then think, oh, okay, there's actually something here. And perhaps it wasn't what you first thought of, but it's a more compelling problem or one that's more painful and more impactful. Um, and to what you said, like you want to find a customer pain because you know people take painkillers they don't necessarily use vitamins um, and so doing that exercise first really allows you to both build your credibility and find who your customers are and if you don't have and if it doesn't work first time then you've saved a ton of time and money building something that perhaps the market doesn't even want i want to add two points to that number one people love talking about themselves they love they telling you what their problems are they love explaining how you can help them they love telling you and you just have to prod a little bit you don't have to mm. ask a lot and the set to the second point um 
we I know our customers, our target customers really well. My my colleagues are in the audience and I know they know who our customers are really, really well with like there's two customer profiles we have and I know where this woman shops. I know where she, who she is. I know how many kids she's got. I know their kids' names. I know their ages. I know every single thing. Mm -hmm. And when you start explaining it to other people who your customer profile is, they're like, I know someone like that. And I'm like, they all have the same problem. Mm -hmm. And that comes from extensive research of talking to people. Yeah. For sure. And it, yeah, but yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> James, how, what can we say to you made or what did you get right during this process? I think the one thing we did right is build that feedback loop very quickly. We wanted to get as much information as possible. Again, 400,000 families moving every single year gave us the ability to intercept those people while they were in motion. And so we got real-time pain points. They were in the pain that we were trying to solve in that moment right there. And so we got real-time feedback that helped us a lot. Um, I think the things that we did wrong were we took the feedback a little bit too literally in some cases, meaning that not all the pain points were identical. Mm -hmm. So some of them kind of spidered off in these different directions and we allowed ourselves to go down that road, maybe went a little bit too horizontal instead of hyper-focusing on our main customer demographic. And we kind of split off into these multiple different ways. And then the second thing I think we did wrong in the beginning was thinking a little bit too linearly meaning that we were so hyper locally focused instead of trying to solve a broader problem that would move the needle a little bit faster to the problem on a bigger scale. So thinking about, man, if we could only fix 10 more people's problems, that's going to help us expand to the next step. And that was such a, we were looking for those 10% gains where I think now we're thinking much more globally in the terms of the bigger customer demographic profile. Um, and trying to scale things more exponentially instead of linearly. Thanks, James. Yeah. So Nick, like, um, so so I think there's myths out there, you know, you get an idea, you do an MVP, and, you know, a month later, you have $10 million, you start founding your network, you're pitching, it's a glorious, glamorous life, but it's not right. Like, people forget Apple to come out like 10 years after they started, right? Yeah. I'm going to give you the idea with Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook kind of like made it big, and the question was, what's like big overnight success? Mark said, well, we don't count the six years I coded in my in my dorm room. We have to go back to six years. Right. right. Can you talk about how you like stay like stay during the journey, and also talk about the loneliness of being a being a founder, right? Because people don't realize how lonely it is being a founder. Whether you're the co-founder, CEO, if you're a founder, it's a lonely journey. Can you talk about that? So what you prefer? Uh, can we reverse this time? Let's yeah, go this way. Go sure. Uh, so it was about loneliness, and then what was the loneliness of the long journey? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, it definitely, I definitely, I think I've also heard quotes that are very similar to my overnight success was a 10-year process. Uh, and I think that's true. There's nothing that really happens. It's about the dedication of waking up every day and putting real effort into the mix to be able to make things happen. Um, I think it makes it's made to look easy from the outside because you don't see what's happening behind the scenes. You see the news articles and the big public service announcements. And that's what you see, but there's so much prep work that goes into the background of that. Um, I think as an owner and a founder, it, it is lonely. I think there's small communities of people that I built from the beginning that are very similar to the people on this panel that we are all kind of facing that same struggle. I think it's also building in feedback loops and, and sandbox conversations with your tight knit internal teams. You know, I had a chief operating officer pretty quickly that was my right-hand man that I relied on for a lot. And we would enter into these random sandbox sessions where we would just talk about stuff and open conversations and throwing ideas against the wall. And so having that ability to have an open space to talk to people who are very close to what you're doing, even if they're not other founders, I think it's really critical to have that that ability to just say things out loud to somebody else that's going to give you real feedback that understands the nuances of, of what you're doing. But I think building small communities inside of your founding idea can be really powerful. Um, I think other founders would be the best uh, kind of feedback loop, but other people at higher levels within the organization can be good as well. Thanks, James. Sarah, please. Um so I've been lucky enough to never be a solo founder. Um, I've always we've, there's always been um, co-founders, and we've got four co-founders at Leap Sheep. Um, so that is quite unusual. I'd say if you're thinking of taking a leap into building a startup, or even if you're an entrepreneur, having um, kind of a, a fellow missionary that you can potentially, as you said, bounce ideas off and talk things through with um, is fabulous. 
Um, so that, um, other than that, I think there's always um, something great about having somebody who can act as a mirror. Um, one and uh, one of the things that we do at LeapSheep is we have startup trained startup building advisors, and so they act often as a mirror, which is you know well, where do you want to get to? What's your vision? Kind of what are the goals that are going to help you get there, and what are the activities that are going to move the needle? And sometimes, most of the time, entrepreneurs and founders actually probably know all of these things, but it's having someone that they can trust and actually to get those things out and also to work out what can not be done. Um, one of the other, the other part of your question, Jason, so it was, there was the loneliness part and then there was the journey. The journey part, yeah. yeah, one of the things that I notice a lot, um, particularly, well, interestingly, you, you have kind of typically two types of founders. So people who are just kind of born to be founders, they've always been innovative, like, you know, they're into tech, you know, they're kind of tinkering with things. Um, and typically they just go straight into founding multiple startups once they've left university. But then a lot a, a lot of the founders that we typically work with are actually founders who perhaps um, kind of had an established career, they've worked in an established business, and then they kind of take the leap into building a startup. Um, and it's the kind of the tech founders that are kind of tinkering. They typically expect that they're gonna go on an, to an accelerator program. They're gonna you know, build and launch an MVP, they're gonna get funded, and it's gonna be this like magical journey. Um, but that happens for really like far less than 1% of founders much more likely is the journey where you know there's kind of a bit of progress perhaps you get some customers um you know perhaps you've got version one of your product um and then you know get some feedback and then you iterate and you know you test out new markets a bit like how you've been doing um and most founders don't raise capital at all they bootstrap they get projects they you know work out ways to make things work um uh, in order to then scale their business and sometimes it leads to kind of a hyper growth but that's like a tiny, tiny fraction. And a lot of the time you get these amazing businesses that are solving problems, they're finding customers and they continue to grow. And that's another outcome, which is just worth calling out. Thanks, Eric. Um, I can definitely speak on the loneliness part and the journey as well. So before we actually launched the product, it was four and a half years of R&D. So that's four and a half years of me in a lab, testing, reiterating, making sure the product does what it says it does. This is... 16 hour days for at least two years on my own and maybe my um lab advisor my my like lab advisor and that's it and it took everything like the pandemic was easy for me because I was used to being on my own so it was just like straight in there get on with it I'd wake up and I'd just go straight in and I'd just do everything it, it was a lonely journey I was very fortunate that I'm kind of good on my own I'm kind of good at working through things and I'm like I'll just get it done but then after when we actually had a product, we finished everything, it was almost like a it was almost like a sense of loss because I was like, oh my gosh, I've created this thing. Now what? What do I do? Where do I go? I'm now surrounded by people and I'm not used to it. It's almost like coming out of being in isolation and then being like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm surrounded. I'm overwhelmed by all these people. I was thrust in on stage and being like, now pitch your product. I'm really fortunate that I have a co-founder who is very good at, um, being the business side of it and being the front of it because I'm I've always said this I'm a scientist I want to be behind the scenes and creating things and now as you know just as luck has it I am put on stage as well I am pitching I am doing a lot of the business side of things which I wasn't used to at the time but the loneliness thing absolutely I'm used I was used to doing that in the lab but when it came to actually the business that was the hardest bit for me was interacting with human beings after spending so much time on my own speaking to essentially one other person did you always have a co-founder i always had a co-founder so this is my first business but um i got very lucky that i have a co-founder i've known him for a very long time and we discuss a lot of things i mean sometimes we come to blows sometimes we get an argument sometimes it's like we butt heads but the point is where it's never me versus you it's always us versus the problem we have to work together to solve the problem and I think that's where you sort of negate on that loneliness thing. And I'm also really fortunate to be involved with a lot of different communities. Mm. I will speak on those community things. You've got to make sure you've got the right people around you. And when I say the right people, as founders, we'll sit here and be like, so how's the business going? Oh yeah, it's great. And we just did this. We just closed this deal. We just did this. The best piece of like advice I got was from a mentor. She said, no, no, I don't want to hear all the fluffy stuff. She's like, how are you? Mm underneath all the bs how are you what are you doing and i'm like you know what it's really tough 
I've, I've spent the best part of 18 hours today looking at a spreadsheet. I'm exhausted. I'm this and that. And she's like, that's what I want to know. I don't want to know all the fluffy stuff. I don't want to know how many, how much you're raising. I want to know how you're doing and how your business is actually doing. I'm like, yeah, we had four customer complaints today. She's like, great, let's work that out. So having the right people and having the right communities that aren't going to just, again, just be like, oh, that's great. Move on to the next thing. How about me? And actually give you advice and actually listen to your problems and you listen to theirs is the key to mitigating that loneliness. That's an, it's an incredible point, right? Because that's the loneliness. The loneliness, I think, is the face of yeah. everything is great. It's being out at these networking events and potential investors and potential customers and potential hires and all the people that you're tasked with bringing on board to your company and putting on that happy face all the time. That's the lonely part, right? Where you are struggling with all of the things, having that conversation and simultaneously seeing all the things you haven't done in the back of your head. So super important to have those people around you. Lucky if you can find it in a co-founder. Um, I'm like you, I was a builder and I wonder if some of the, the tinkerers are that way too, right? I'm happy, I, my background is in product management. So I had built these little products within a bigger organization, but I'm a builder. I want to just be there working with devs, built, making requirements, solving problems, and then letting somebody else run the business. And it's scary to mm -hmm. have to level up to that. And that process um, is really long. We could have been um, what I would call death by slow growth many times, right? If your company is not growing quickly and it's not making revenue, it's it's dying. It's not, right? Nobody, you can't just sustain a nothing business for a really long time. I'm, um, I think that the, this next decade of um, startups and capital um, markets will change. I think how we talk about startups and what we see, right? I think that we have spent the last 10 years in such a frothy capital market that you saw those stories, right? Where it's like, oh, they had an idea. They got all this money. Um, gosh, that's how it's going to be. I mean, I had a... Um, a leader at the company that I left, I had worked for both startups to public companies, all technology over the years, and had someone tell me as I went out to make that that jump, he's like, just get a couple customers and you'll be great. You'll go and raise some money. And I was like, okay, well, now I have like 5,000 of them and we're still not raising money. So what what will it take, right? And it took building that momentum and then going through that next chapter, right? We spent three years bootstrapped. We spent three years venture-backed and then, um, and then on to this next chapter. Um, it, you have to be in it for the long haul. I don't think, and, and thinking about the win and what you define as that win, right? Which I think for a lot of founders for the last 10 years has been raising capital. I will be a success when I have raised my first round and then my big round, and then you're off to the races. And we know that um, raising money does not equal a successful business. We've seen it really, I think, um, publicly at the, you know, the closing of one of Seattle's biggest tech companies in the last, you know, month that was really hard um, to watch because by all um, measures, I think we would have said um, that company was hugely successful. And the answer is it didn't make enough money to support its business. So um, for me, I think the thing I would have focused on at the very beginning of the journey that would have changed our destiny would have been um, focusing on how we're going to make money and how we are going to control our own path forward. Thanks, Laura. So I'll follow up on that. So I don't know if y'all are very single or very person like this, but like talk about points of telling the people around you, like your loved ones, like, hey, I'm doing this like five, six years, right? You know, what, and make sure to support you. They know like all that kind of stuff. Go with you first name. Sure. I make it very clear to the people around me, the, the life I live is not normal <laughs> and don't expect normal for sure. Uh, I'm, I don't know any founder that doesn't put in long hours, um, work weekends and other stuff like that. And I'm not saying that, you know, one way or another, I think there's a, you know, you got to do what's best for you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I have the luxury of not having family or anything like that. So I can, you know, I can be at the desk at two o'clock in the morning and, and hustling, you know, that's fine. Um, but I, I think it's about setting clear expectations with the people around you because we live a unique life and you're, it's owning a business, operating a business is a unique life. And so I think having your protocol for what works best for you and being self-aware around what's going to really help you get to that success and then articulating that to other people is that's critical. Yeah, I often joke on my podcast that 
for you cannot really be taken as kind of mental health test, right? Yeah. But all of us, if we're not normal, we're all of us are crazy, <laughs> right? So we need some kind of mental health test. Hundred percent. So who's next there? Um, I actually have two uh, two daughters who are seven and nine, and I'm married. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that I have had to adapt to over time, though, is there were definitely, and again, not recently, but I have spent a lot of time at like two or three a.m. in the cupboard, like frantically typing away to get something done for a customer. Um, and I regularly, and even now, I'll say, "Oh, I'll be finished by nine. I'll be finished by 10. and then another hour goes and. Um, that's the one thing that I have had to, about your point about te- setting clear expectations is I have had to be uh, my husband has said that if you're gonna if you say you're gonna finish at a certain time it's like I'm I'm not gonna believe you anymore so that's the one thing I'm actually now working really hard on is saying when I'm gonna finish and then finishing um, and because I've got children as well like I want to prioritize time with them so yes I will work hard and sometimes I work long hours um, but I also I want a life, <laughs> and I think it's important to have a life. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm trying to juggle both, and I don't always do it well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think work life balance is so important. I again every single day it was every day, every weekend, all day. And if it was down to me, it would be all day. Um, I will never forget at the time I was working three jobs and doing my business. I was living at home with my parents, and my mother said to me, "I haven't seen you in three weeks." And I said, and you yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I was like, well, mom, I'm really, really busy. And she's like, we live in the same house. I haven't seen you in three weeks. What is going on? And I've learned now, I, I, had, to, I had to learn that pretty quickly. It was like, you've got, when the, when the laptop is closed, the laptop is closed. When it gets to 8 p.m., the laptop is closed and nobody's calling me. I was like, don't call me unless the building is on fire, unless there is an absolute emergency, please don't. My co-founder is there. He's working on a, a different time zone to me sometimes. So I'm like, please call him or I will deal with it tomorrow. Can it be done tomorrow? Because everyone who calls you, and I, especially in this day and age, before they have to write you a letter or they'll send you an email. But in this day and age, everyone demands your time now with things like mm-hmm. WhatsApp, with things like Telegram, with all these social media apps. Everyone demands your time now. They want your time and they can see you've read their message. So they're like, why haven't you responded? You don't get to have my time. My time is my time only, and I have to be extremely strict with that. Because if I'm not, I would spend all night texting and calling and emailing every single person and trying to get through it. I'm like, no, no, my laptop is out, and you're lucky I haven't put my out of office hours on because it's done, you know? Um, I'm really fortunate that my family understand that. I was actually saying this to you earlier, that I've got a two, almost two-year-old niece, so she lives in the UK. And I try and go back as often as I can because I don't want to miss her growing up. She's really important to me. And my family is super, super important to me. But when you say you're busy, when you say you're busy as founders to other people who aren't founders, they're like, oh, yeah, you're busy doing stuff. And I'm like, no, busy means busy, busy, busy. I have no time for relationships. I have no time for, for any of it. I have to just get on with what I'm doing. But when, now I'm like, when I'm done and when I've, when that laptop is closed, when that phone is off, it's done. And I've got the time. How many? How long do you think you're going to be able to keep that up for? Because I mean, I because I I feel like we, I at the start I was very much like I would work as many hours as I could possibly fit in. But the the realization I have had is it's a marathon. Whether you're an entrepreneur or a startup founder, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like you're sprinting. How much longer do you think you can keep it up? Keep up um, setting yeah. that boundary. Well, I guess now you've got a boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, so yeah. I, I so yeah. Spent, fair, fair enough. Yeah. I spent, yeah. So the business is what eight years old. Yeah. So I spent six of it sprinting through six years doing endless endless stuff like from six till 10 sometimes to 11 sometimes till till one and it's only now when I was like I am so burnt out like last year went through an extremely difficult time business wise personal wise and everything else and I was like I did not utilize the time I had with the people who are on this earth and now they're gone and I had to make that decision because if I don't I'm gonna regret it there's, there's actually a really interesting analogy. Have you guys ever heard of the story of the guy who ate an airplane? Oh. This is a real story. Um, and it comes from the idea of how do you eat an elephant, mm. right? You you chunk it. You, you chunk it up into smaller bits. And I'm not lying. Like, this is a real story. You can Google it. A dude ate an airplane. And that was his thing is he would eat metal objects. He, he ate multiple buses, um, and this sounds insane, and it is insane. I read the story and I didn't believe it at first. But the dude ate an airplane, 
and he ate it by chunking it up into tiny little bits. It's a really interesting story. I definitely recommend. Uh, but the, the analogy here is, as a founder, you are going to do something ridiculously audacious. You The marathon example is absolutely true. This is not a, I mean, they're sprinting within the marathon, but this is a long-term engagement. And that's how you need to think about it. If we're going to move the needle and build a massively transformative purpose, this is not something that can happen overnight. So if it's going to take five years to do the thing that you want to build, you really have to think about how we chunk that up. Now, this is where the balance comes in. How much time am I going to allocate today to this thing? But at the end of the day, you are going to be eating an airplane and you can't do it by swallowing the thing whole. It takes chunking it up. And so that's, um, that is something where, you know, and I'm okay working till two o'clock in the morning on certain days because I'm allocating that time and I'm being very deliberate about it. When I didn't do that and I just said, I'm going to work as much as I possibly can and I let it control me, then that's where the work-life balance really becomes unstable. And that's where you hit burnout because you're just, your, ga your gas pedal is to the metal the entire time and it isn't sustainable. Eventually you're going to run out of gas. So it's, that, but look up that story because it, it is, is a really interesting analogy to this conversation, how chunking becomes the tool that you use to break up really, really audacious big tasks into something that's a lot more palatable. I think a lot about the trade-offs in my family, right? Like you said, people think, what, what does a founder do? Like I'm here in the middle of the day. <laughs> well, that's lovely. But, you know, my husband came home last night and I was working away at 10 o'clock and he made some comment about always working. Now he works with me. So it's for the mutual <laughs> benefit. But I was like, yeah, but I, you caught me laying down at two o'clock today. Like I am at my kids, you know, things at school because I'm, I work at night. And so to me, it's not like, oh, I'm working all the time. Like I feel fortunate that there are trade-offs in this life um, that make it so that the long hours don't, don't bother me as much. I think the boundaries are super important. I think learning from your family and, and um, you know, the people that you want to spend time with um, coming to an understanding. So I, you know, even this morning was having a, a hard moment because my um, husband recognized I I have to check in in the morning. Yes, things can wait, but things have happened with development overnight. The East Coast team is up and working. I wake up and I do look at things first thing. And that is not, um, a lot of people recommend don't do that. But for me, I can't get my day going without knowing what has happened overnight. I need to have 30 minutes with my cup of coffee to check all the different Slack channels and know what is going on. And so my husband said, great, I was noticing that it was a struggle for you to do that and engage with the family in the morning. Therefore, I'm taking on mornings. I'm gonna do breakfast, I'm gonna do lunches. You just need to do work and get ready for your day. Why well, had a hard time with a kid coming in and wanting to snuggle this morning. And I'm like, but I'm in the middle of, this is now my routine, right? And so then we have to flex. And it's a juggle and it always will be. But because we have established these even little micro boundaries in how our family works together, that allows us to get that cadence so that then I can go, I've done it. I've done my stuff. I close my computer. I close my computer at 8 a.m. and go and do kid stuff for an hour and then get back to work. So it's, it's not like the same for everyone. It's almost like the collective hours. So mm -hmm. people say, oh, founders work long hours. But sometimes when you actually collate the hours that they actually work, it's still a nine to five. It's just separated throughout the 100%. day you know? or in your case at 2 a.m. You're right, right, <laughs> right. Where, wherever it needs to be. Yeah, so James, uh, I'm going to hear you tell a story about uh, how you had to go stop the COVID. North, yeah, North Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so my very first business, which was my only venture-backed um, company that I built, uh, this was back in 2011, 12-ish. Um, and so I put a bunch of, of my own money in, um, I got an SBA back 7B loan. Uh, I raised $125,000 from, um, from other private capital fundraisers. Uh, this was not something where we were moving the needle or doing anything audacious. It was just my first venture into entrepreneurship and learned a lot of very hard lessons. Ultimately, overcapitalized, overhired, was behind on construction because of things that we couldn't control. We missed our opening date. There were just a lot of problems and a lot of lessons that I learned in that experience. And so ultimately, um, I closed the doors to that company 18 months after I started it and moved to North Dakota uh, because during that time, uh, there was a gold rush happening uh, in the oil fields. 
And so I uh, closed the doors and uh, liquidated everything and ultimately drove to North Dakota from Washington State uh, with no job, no place to live, um, didn't have anything lined up at all. But I knew people who were there who were basically illustrating the fact that they've never seen money move faster in their entire life. And within three weeks, I had my CDL license. I, I had bought a truck and a trailer. I ultimately started another company um, that was really riding the wave of, of the oil field boom, uh, the, the gold rush. Uh, and and that, that company ended up being incredibly successful until 2015, where the oil field as an industry crashed um, virtually overnight. Um, and that's what led me to the business that I'm in now. But ultimately, it's I had to make a very hard decision in that moment of the lessons that were learned were so catastrophic that I knew we we weren't going to be able to make it. And so had to make some very hard choices and close the door, but had to make that transition. And, and it was a very bold, you know, <laughs> moving to a state I've never been to before and in an industry I've never been involved in uh, to basically try and uh, collect money with a giant net, which did work, but it's scary, very scary. Can I can I talk about the bravery of shutting down a startup? Mm. Right, like keeping a startup going. As as I said, we could have died by slow growth multiple times at a given time, and it was really just my circumstances that had me keep going. I think that if if I had objectively looked at my business, I probably would have said. Find something else. Yeah. Um, but my circumstances, I had a new baby and my husband was working. And so there were, it allowed us to keep going. Um, shutting down a startup early yeah. um, and respectfully and without burning bridges, I think is, um, is, is incredibly brave. Yeah. And I think more founders should take hard looks at those measures of success for themselves and yeah. um and considering you probably work with a lot of founders who have to navigate those tough choices huh well interest yes so there are a number of founders that we work with who have closed their businesses typically um one of the things that we help with is and that point about falling in love with a problem not with your solution idea is that there's so you, as long as you are keeping your costs down as small as you can yeah. there's plenty of time to experiment and move between potential customer segments product ideas iterating and iterating i think the the more the usually founders close down because perhaps they've done like as you said like overcapitalized they've kind of put everything in on one thing and then if that doesn't work then they've got nowhere to go whereas so whenever we're working with founders it's like well okay, what's your kind of overall vision? And then let's work out the best potential path to take you there. And so we typically have less founders that have to make the decision to shut down because we've helped them to go as far as they can with a very low burn rate. Um, and so, yes, we have had founders where we've helped them to make that choice to shut down. Sometimes they've been too early. Sometimes they've had a load of new competitors come up. But typically, like, I think once you start on an entrepreneurial or startup journey, you probably, you, you it's kind of, you get hooked, like, Typically, it's like, well, maybe that idea didn't work, but you can go to a different one. So I think my probably my key thing would be is don't put everything into it and over hire, over capitalize too quickly yeah. until you've got that validation of the problem in the market. But, I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, if I knew then what I knew now, I never would have started that first business. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Like, there's it was objectively the wrong place, period, across the board. And so I, I think about that a lot. <laughs> now in my decision making right it's uh, really objectively looking at that having the right stuff set up in place and is this where i actually want to be is the market actually there like asking better questions and i just i mean this was my very first official business you just don't know what you don't know right i want to counter on that a little bit as well because there have been multiple times so after all of our products are in bed the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and our manufacturers said hey we're making ppe we can't make your product and we had a product, but we and we had customers who really wanted it. We had pre-orders from customers, and we're like, "Yeah, we're going to deliver it to you." Our manufacturer had shut down. One of our investors dropped out after Brexit, and literally, like, like the day Brexit was announced, our German investor was like, "No," mm -hmm. he's like, "No, no, no more investment." Then the pandemic and the pandemic hit. No manufacturing. We had, I think it was three thousand customers who had pre-ordered, paid money, Oof. and been like we want our product and it's the pandemic. So they're like, the demand is here. Mm -hmm. And I had to tell every single one of those customers, hey, can't give you a refund because we've spent the money. <laughs> and also we have no manufacturing because they're doing 
what they can. And of course, all the manufacturers were making PPE to save people's lives. And we can't exactly say, hey, can you make our wipes? So what you did know, you do? Uh, we spoke to our customers and said, you will get an entire year's free when we get our manufacturing up and running. We spoke to all of our customers directly. We wrote handwritten notes. We, it was a lot. It was a lot. But at that point, I was like, what are we going to do? We, sh- we should shut down. Should we shut down? And we pushed through and got through it. And then last year, again, massive dip, big issues with one of our manufacturers where we had to change our manufacturers again. Similar sort of thing. Our company had very little runway left. We were like, do we call it a day, liquidate our assets? And each time, both of both me and my co-founder were like, this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to tell our families we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to either sell some of our assets or, I mean, I'm assetless right at the moment, but do we sell a house to try and cover and bootstrap? Do we do we sell shares? Do we What do we do to try and overcome this? Or is it a time we call it a day? And December last year, I was like, we are done. I'm done. I've had enough. Burn rate was terrible. Lots of personal issues. I'm done. I want to be out of this as quickly as possible. And then we got a call from an investor saying they wanted to invest to bring our product over to the States. If it wasn't for that call, the business would have been shut down, but we persevered. And that those few months, I lost half a stone. So I lost seven pounds in a week. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. And it was just the worst, worst point of course but the perseverance and the sheer like the sheer stubbornness of both of us not wanting this company to die is what got us to the states today because we didn't have that and if it wasn't for that call we would be on our on our butts like massively so i love that outcome for you yeah it's not always we got lucky we got very very lucky we um were in a similar place at the end of last year where we were cutting our burn um we were going to be able to survive but it would be really lean i could just be right hey we're approaching cash flow positivity if nobody gets paid (laughs) exactly (laughs) we can cover our azure costs um and i sent a cold linkedin dm to the um founder of the company that ended up acquiring us 90 days later wow. so like when you think it's dark and it gets dark and it is dark right and you're like objectively there's here's all of this but here is that problem and here is that passion and here's everything that i've worked for and so i think taking chances being open to the phone call making the phone call right can really change the trajectory of your business yeah we got very very lucky all right we're going to open the front of the front right now so you got a question um, I guess thank yeah, I'm curious. Um, yeah, I still seven, so like eleven years of seven. So I don't know like how much longer this is gonna go, but um, yeah, I mean I, I hear you guys talking about your customers, and I'm curious about the difference between like your customers and your clients, so like who your end user is versus who your actual clients are, because you know like depending on what your pay model is and how your business is set up, like who the end user is could be different from like who your actual customers are. So um, if we could just talk about like the consumer, like because, you know, with wipes, like I don't know if you're direct to consumer, like people are buying the product itself or if your customer is like a business and so, you know, mm-hmm. it's different or like real estate, like are you a government contract? So your, you know, your customer is different from like your end user. So. Yeah, we can just talk about it. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, the different customer segments for me personally has a lot to do with what the service is in general. So, like, we're a full-service property management company. Sometimes that's a homeowner. Sometimes that's a LLC that owns a 60-unit apartment complex. Sometimes it's USDA's low-income housing program. Um, so there's there's a lot of different things there. But we are building the services around the customer psychographics and demographics. And that's where our our models are going to be different depending on what the services are. Um, But ultimately we had to think through that and build it all out kind of through the path of where, where does the money flow? How does it flow? Who are the people spending it? And then we're building structure and infrastructure around that conversation. So I, I would argue that our end users um, vary across the board. They could be home buyers, could be home sellers, could be renters, could be the government, um, could be 
other businesses, other investors that own assets and stuff like that. So we do have, you know, three to four major customer sets that we think about and then building very hyper-focused um, product sets and models around the thought process of going through the path of their pain points and stuff like that. So when you started, I mean, like, and I guess it was, it was a follow-up question, but is your model, I mean, I'm sure pain points seems like time, but when you started out, is, is what you sort of now, like, you know, you talked to segments, is that what you went into the business when you went to the beat, or did it's a great question. So for me personally, I started very simply as a real estate agent. I'm going to help people buy and sell, right? And I just wanted to get that process going, um, which worked. Um, the timing of the market was just where it needed to be. Um, but that was all it was. I didn't have property management. There was no commercial real estate. There was no government contracting. It was just the typical out of the box, you know, purchase and sale. Um, and that has evolved multiple times. That still exists. We still have that division. That's still a big piece of what we do. Um, but through the feedback loops and figuring out exactly where the pain points are, that led us, you know, we we discovered um, through a survey of, I think it was about 6,500 military families, that 72% of those, that demographic that was incoming into joint pay solicitation support into this area did not want to purchase in the first 12 months of living in that new location. They didn't know what schools were going to be best for their kids, where their spouse was going to work, how the distance, uh, you know, there's 10 cities around the base, so which one is going to be the best? They didn't know. So we found that feedback that said, well, we want to rent for the first year and then we'll think about buying. So that led us to go ahead and move to control the inventory of rental properties around military installations to engage in that conversation earlier. And now we've got a little over $120 million management just around J JBLM. Uh, and now we're scaling that into other places. So it started as a very simple, um, you know, it, it's the minimum viable product. Ultimately. You know, this is what real estate companies do. But through the feedback, we changed our customer demographic, which then led to property management with government contracting and other things like that. Yeah. Uh, so, Thank you. Um, oh, does anyone else want to yeah, I could speak on a product front. So I know, I think I'm the only product on the panel. So when you mentioned direct to consumer, so we started as a direct to consumer product and much like James, our, our uh, business changed. So we started as a direct to consumer because of margins, like retail, the margins are tiny, 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 tiny. In the States, it's slightly different. So in the States, the margins are slightly bigger and we will be going into retail in the States. So our clients will then become the targets, the Walmarts, the Whole Foods, the Wegmans, the, the tops, all of these local supermarkets, Lexington Co-op, I think it's Huckleberry, I think it's Huckleberry. Um, but it will be supermarkets or it'll be uh, small boutique retailers. Whereas in the direct to consumer side, our end user is the person we're selling to. So we know our customer profiles for our end user. We can make assumptions about retail, but it really depends on where you're selling. So the target, the customers are very different if you're shopping in Target versus shopping in Whole, uh, uh, Walmart, for example. The customer demographics are different and that's when you speak to those, you speak to your clients and say, hey, who, what ages are your customers actually, are the end users going to be? What are the ages? What are the demographics? What are the um, socioeconomic status? Can they afford the product? Where is the product going to be uh, placed? And how are they going to use it? How like, are they going to contact? Exactly. Where is it going to be placed on the shelf? Is it going to be in a baby aisle? Is it going to be in skincare? Is it going to be in beauty? Those questions come with the with a different clientele. Direct to consumer is infinitely easier on one hand, but you also have to convince more people to use your product. Whereas with Target, if it's in your if it's in a Target store, they're like, ah, we know Target. We know they sell these brands. We're going to purchase. Whereas they're like, I don't know you. Convince me to use your product. Uh, uh, this young gentleman right here. Uh, comments and questions. Comments about what's important to the channel. In particular, uh, what I tell people the reason you should be an entrepreneur is because we're all in a job. <laughs> and you might as well your, live your life at its highest highs mm -hmm. and its lowest lows. <laughs> and you do that when you're an entrepreneur. Love that. Here are the highlights and the lowlights. And it's a wonderful way to live your life. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I hear across the panel is some of the difficulties that you've encountered. And I know we're trying to grow 
a, a culture of entrepreneurship and stuff. So sometimes I feel like if we set it up as these are the bars that we're going to have to clear, very difficult bars, it's almost a dissuader to those who have not culturally been raised in an entrepreneurial environment. You think, can you think of ways in which you can um, promote entrepreneurship as yourselves and as your companies as being a very positive outcome no matter what the exit is? I've got a company that mm -hmm. I had to crash land and I was called back in because a lot of people lose their job. That's the pain point for my entrepreneurial journey. But I look back at the new fond memories of that company and I think it's worth a lot for it. I think it's about preparing people for sure. So we, I know we're all like disaster on here. We're like, this is, it's going to be really like, it's crazy starting a business, but, and you do have to be a little bit mad. I think we're, it's a real Alice in Wonderland. We're all mad here as founders. Um, I think it's preparing people. So whilst it's an overarchingly very positive experience to start a business and people need to know that, but they need to know the pitfalls. They need to know that it is lonely. It can be very difficult. It can be challenging. And I come from a pessimist country where like most of the time we're not like everything's shiny, not everything is shiny. You're like, this is really hard. And it's important to tell people that it's really hard, but it does come with positives. And I think a lot of accelerator programs show you the positives and a lot of um, incubator programs show you all the positives of businesses. Mm -hmm. And when you speak to the founders, they then tell you it, how hard it is and how difficult it is. So I think there is a balance um then perhaps needs to be on another more of a balance but if people are dissuaded from starting a business because they're afraid of the risk or the challenges or the negative things that founders tell them maybe they're not the right people to start the business in the first place i think there's also the element of um like one of the great things i think about being an entrepreneur or a startup founder is that you have the opportunity to build the type of team and the type of culture and the type of business that you want to build like, you know, I worked in two um, large companies before I worked at LeapSheet um, and, you know, they were fine, but I had to work within a structure and there were there was politics and there was this and that. And now in a startup or even, you know, and this is, I think, true of startups and entrepreneurs, you get to hire the people that you want. You get to set the culture that you get to set. And there's something that's extremely compelling when you're also looking to solve a problem that you really want to change and impact in the world. And really, like, what's more exciting than that? So, yes, there is there are some challenges, um, but it's also, I think, extremely liberating and it doesn't feel like work. Like, you know, I, when in my previous jobs, if I had to work late, I'd be annoyed. Whereas here, I'm like, if I've got spare time, I want to work on this because it, I feel it's so important and I'm so driven. And, and, you know, I'm lucky enough to work with founders. So, like, our customers are the same as, as us. And so it's like it's, it's you know, I get to work with exciting, interesting, fascinating people all day, every day. Like who wouldn't want that? All right, so we got to move on with that. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You have to answer another question? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, this question is for uh, Sarah, Eleanor, and Laura. I was very pleased to see three female founders on the panel floor. So that's, that's really great news. Um, so we know, well, <laughs> many of us who follow this know that um, Women-led startups contribute about 3% of VC funding. Um, and one really, I guess, salient example is Canada founder Melanie Perkins was turned down 100 times by VC. And now she has 26, so she has, she runs a $26 billion other company, Canva. Um, so for the women on the panel, who, uh, when faced with those kinds of odds and all those challenges that are very unique to female founders, where do you turn to for support? Uh, what communities, what resources, especially to share with the prospective female founders in the audience, um, you know, communities both in person and virtual and other resources? Because I, um, so I, I co-lead a, a women in tech group um, in Seattle that is in Japan, Tacoma, um, and so female, women in power and leadership is really important to me and to us and to my organization. And yeah, I just know that a lot of these resources that were maybe available prior to the pandemic and the thought that exists are too many for female founders, female founders wanting to do for this call and other ones. So either locally or, or globally, what kind of resources do you have on hand? 
Um, I can actually speak specifically to the Female Founders Alliance. It has just been rebranded and is now a part of the Graham and Walker Fund. Mm -hmm. And so they actually are pretty still actively engaged. So okay. definitely, definitely connect, definitely connect with them. Yes, in a, in a similar way. Um, I think there are some other um, female founder communities that I've engaged with um, over the years on Facebook, for example, as a place to build some of those relationships. Um, less so in person. I mean, I think one of the trade-offs of being a female founder is that, like, I'm not going to the five o'clock happy hours uh, regularly to meet people because, you know, add it to the things that I juggle. Um, I think that uh, investment in female founders is not going, um, not to be a pessimist, is not going to improve um, in this in this capital market. Um, I mean, unless there's more female investors. I don't think they're correlated. No. I want to double click, we could look at it, but I actually don't think, I think there was a study recently that said that female founders who had a female investor lead their seed or A had a lower rate of getting follow on funding. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's just, it's, it's wild. Um, I do think we face unique challenges. Finding those communities is important. Happy to connect and share whatever um, I have, you know, it, but it's, it's, it's limited. All right, so sure. we need to move on real fast. So next, in 30 seconds or less, do you have any advice or wisdom you want to, you want to pass on to MJ first? No, no pressure. Ooh. It's on. You're signing up for potentially losing everything and gaining everything at the same time. Take the time before you put product to market, build the roadmap. Be super, super thoughtful around thinking through everything you can without getting analysis paralysis, but be willing to take calculated risks and be thoughtful around the people that you bring onto your bus. It's a Jim Collins good to great model. Mm -hmm. the, the people around you are going to be the most important part. The product, the problem are all important, but the people are going to be your core strength in really building something amazing. Thanks, James. Sir? Um, there's a, a, a phrase, fail fast, which seems to be really big in the Seattle, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if it's also Tacoma area. Um, and I really don't like that phrase, because I think if you're really invested in an idea, like run a series of small experiments, keep your burn rate low until you've got validation from the market. And then, and only then do you then want to kind of start to invest. And also, like if you're hiring like VP of sales, like, you know, senior tech people at the very beginning, you're likely going to just burn a load of money and not make the right uh, decisions. Like if you can, the people that you want in your early team are people who can have conversations with customers, kind of brainstorm, be generalists and act where the business needs them. So find those kind of people. And if it's just you doing it, then it also means that you can experiment and keep and kind of extend your runway out. That would be mine. Thanks, mine is always no man or woman is an island. Talk to people and get help. Like you may have all of the skills that you think you have to start a business, but you need a team. You need people around you who are better than you. I hire people who are better than me because they're, very, they're the ones who are going to really help you with the, They're the ones who are really helpful with the business. Preach, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Laura? Um, I believe, well, I think the best advice anyone can have right now is make money. Um, but also measure what matters, figure out real early on how to, what your metrics of success are and measure them and track them um, and use them as your guidepost. Because otherwise it can be really easy to be like, well, we're not succeeding on this thing we were going to, but look, we have all of this potential or growth and this metric like downloads. Well, that's not, you know, depending on what your business is, right? That might not be the metric that, that needs to be used for success. So um, gather your data and, and use it, use that to make decisions, not always just your... Um, following your passion. I want to thank the panel. So very last question. So each of you, how can we help you? You have an app for us. Anything that the, that the crowd or uh, audience would like to help you out with or go with you for as long? Um, we're growing into using Given Kind for teams. Um, it's been an awesome bottom-up way of seeing how people were using the platform. They use it to support their coworkers. And so if you know somebody who has a team, a large company, a place that you'd like to introduce Given Kind as a, as a benefit, um, or just use it in your personal life, that's always my ask. Um, we're looking to expand into the Seattle-Tacoma area. So any connections to manufacturing, any connections to retail, and any connections to where we can get this uh, get swipes out there as much as possible would be great for me. Um, 
we if you know a founder who's struggling or needs help then feel free to connect us or if that's you connect with me um i always like to help founders and we have a system that kind of supports what we do so i'm very happy to help you thanks Jim. I'm really just looking to connect with military uh, affiliated people, veterans, active duty, uh, anywhere in the country. We're, we're looking to plant our flag and become the household name in military housing. So we're looking to solve problems for that demographic and it's beyond just housing. So just connecting, you know, you need a military family. Hey, have you heard of Operation Red Dot? Like, let's talk. Let's do it. Thanks, everyone. I'm sure they're going to hang out a few minutes to ask a question one-on-one. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. I was also really happy to see three women on the panel. Okay. I think I think we need Jason more women involved. Well, Jason, can I borrow you for a second? Just yeah, for a quick I think it's nice. It's nice to have a mix. Before, yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Before,